Thank you, everybody. Welcome back. Can I please ask people to settle in as quickly as possible? We have a really full schedule for this next session. Thank you. Okay, as we open this session, I would like to personally acknowledge that we're meeting on um, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, and acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of these lands. We're guests on Wurundjeri land for this forum. As you will see in the program, you're about to experience a whirlwind tour of 10 projects that are either currently part of the core research program of NHRA or soon to be, and three PhD presentations. So we have 13 presentations for you over the next hour and a half. Obviously, that means timing is going to be no mean feat. So we'll be keeping very tight time. So for presenters, can I please ask the people speaking in this session, make sure that you're up towards the front and easily able to jump up and down. I can't fit everybody on the stage all at once, so I won't be asking you to come up and sit on the stage with me, but I'll be calling presenters up one by one. Um, we have a timer down here, Nicola's sitting down here in the front. And for presenters, we actually have a clock here on the stage as well, but Nicola will be putting up a yellow sign where you've got a minute left. The red card means you finish that sentence and you're moving off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we will have Slido open, and so I'll let presenters know once you've done your presentation up here, if you can go into Slido, put the forum code in, if there are questions there for you, um, please, you can provide little short answers in the Slido app to people. Um, if you're putting questions up in this session, please put the speaker's name at the front of your question just to make it clear who, you, who you'd like to hear from. And also, just keep in mind that quite a few of the projects you'll be hearing from in this session have workshops on tomorrow. This is a really good chance to hear a little bit about a bunch of different projects and help you choose which workshop you might like to go to tomorrow to um, raise some more questions and, and kind of dig into that project in some more detail. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our first project to come up. So Dr. Leanne Bird and her colleagues, Lindsay Wright and Don Sharples from Altometer, are going to come up and talk about what is quite a unique project on our program, storing and sharing qualitative social data. Thanks. Thank you, Blythe, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so yes, we're here um, to take your data. And we mean that in not a data breach kind of way. We're not talking about Optus or Medibank. Uh, we're talking about the qualitative research data that you collect, uh, often during post-disaster research um, projects, uh, but also in other environments as well. Excellent, it works. Um, so the case for sharing uh, uh, sharing your qualitative data. Obviously, we all know that this is, um, it, it's a good thing to do. Uh, it dramatically increases the volume of data available for research. So what that means is if we do have this data stored where other people can access it, it helps us create those longitudinal data sets. It also um, helps the collection process because we can look at what has happened in the past, what stories have been shared, and get a context, uh, better context for the people that we're going to be talking to, uh, the people that have been through different hazard um, environments previously, how they've prepared, how they've responded, and compare that to the data that we're collecting in that um, point of time. It also reduces the burden on the, uh, the burden on those affected communities. So having people uh, asking people to retell their stories over and over again does create quite a lot of stress. Uh, if we have that data that is available um, to us for other research projects, it really uh, takes that stress away from them. And now I'm going to hand over to Lindsay. The case for data sharing is obviously overwhelming, uh, and. We are also behind the pack. Our friends at the Natural Hazard Centre in Boulder already have guidelines and a framework for the sharing of qualitative data. 
Most publishing houses, at a minimum, have a requirement that we provide a data availability statement, and this applies to both qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, indeed, if you aspire to submit to Nature, it is actually a requirement that you make your data readily available to the editors and reviewers when you submit a manuscript. It's no longer the norm that our ethics committees expect to see a statement that says we will destroy data within a specified time period. Rather, the national statement actually tells us that we should be thinking about data sharing from the outset of our project. It's not a requirement that we share our data, but it is a requirement that we think about it. But we do need to be cautious. Qualitative data and qualitative data analysis is different from that that we do with quantitative data. Data collection is often based on trust, trust between the researcher and the participant, and trust between the researcher and the affected communities. We need to respect that trust when we share our data. We do de-identify our data, but is it sufficient for when we are sharing that with others? And for those collecting the data, we need to be mindful of the context that we're in. We need to be cautious that others won't necessarily understand that context. I'm sure there are plenty of other reasons why you would be cautious about sharing your data, and we want to know and understand those and overcome them. And Don's going to tell us how we're going to do that. Esteemed colleagues, the, um, the project we're running is really simple. Um, we intend to, as we've just laid out, uh, ask you, in fact, about what the pros are, what the cons are, um, what benefits there may be, what barriers there are to sharing. Uh, we're also going to talk about what some of the interventions might be. Are there any rules that are required? There's a whole um, range of activities that are going to be rolled out over the next few months to collect that information. But the really important message is that we want to collect it from you. You're the experts on this. We're going to start off tomorrow um, with one of the sessions um, mid-morning or late in the hour, or it's just in the middle of the day sometime. And uh, yeah, we'd love you all to come along and t talk to us about your experiences um, with, sharing, with sharing this data or your thoughts on how it could be done. And uh, so we'd love to see you all tomorrow. If you need to contact us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, that's to register either for that or, or any of the other things that we're going to be doing over the next few months. So here's our contact details. See you tomorrow. Right on the dot, five minutes, well done. All right, I'd now like to invite Professor Lauren Rickards from La Trobe University up to talk about the, another one of our projects, Understanding the Resilience of Lifelines for Regional and Remote Communities. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Blythe, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the land here we're on. So our project, Understanding the Resilience of Lifelines for Rural and Remote Communities, is a collaboration between RMIT, Monash, Latrobe, we keep growing, <laughs> and the Australian Resilience Centre, and many of our colleagues are here today. So as the title suggests, our aim is to advance thinking about lifeline resilience in Australia, particularly in relation to rural and remote communities. So, of course, the first question is lifelines. What are they? So that is actually the right question to ask and one that's actually at the very heart of our project because unlike in countries like the US, lifelines is not a common term or policy focus in Australia. Our working definition, quite a high level one at this point, is that lifelines are the successful interactions between infrastructure, essential services, supply chains, and critically, people that enable communities to survive and thrive. So you'll detect in that uh, working definition that ideas of resilience are actually embedded into the notion of lifelines. And so teasing apart the pairing of lifelines and resilience is something we've been working on, drawing on a highly diverse range of literature. And to kind of get to grips with this, we've been unpacking and comparing how the different components that we mentioned, 
the ones indicated here, the three sets of enablers, critical infrastructure, essential services and supply chains with people at the centre, all usher in different perspectives on threats and different notions of resilience. It's also important to note here that these enablers are not independent of settlement patterns, including what counts as rural and remote. So just think, for example, the very absence of infrastructure actually helps to generate and also to define remoteness. And because these enablers actively shape our living environments, they shape different communities and individuals' relative capacity and vulnerability. And so some of you will pick up where I'm going here, which means that they're not independent of disasters. So what this means is that lifelines are not something that disasters just happen to. They're something that disasters happen through over both long periods and also in the near term when they fail. So what this means is that lifelines aren't things that just pop up in disasters. Their presence or absence and their particular qualities actually partially determine the likelihood and consequences of risks and thus shape the disasters that manifest. So all of this uh, makes it very clear that lifelines are complex, multifaceted, uh, and are characterised by a lot of internal tensions. So to try to sort of work all through this, we're taking a system of systems kind of approach, very much a cross-disciplinary one, and we're trying to synthesise the benefits of this into a different workable model. So in doing so, we're particularly trying to think about what does it mean to shift thinking from one based on these components, so like a critical infrastructure perspective, which as we know is very active in the Australian government policy uh, setting, shift from that towards lifeline resilience, or I should say extend beyond that, because we see these enablers as necessary but not sufficient for lifelines. In particular, what we want to do is try to put people at the centre, and when you do that, you need to shift your orientation. It's not enough to look down and to map where these things are. It's about looking out at the experience of the interactions between these factors. So it forces us to ask, do the enablers interact effectively? What are they actually enabling? What are they perhaps disabling? In other words, what we have to do is to understand that people's experiences is the key metric of success of the functional interaction of these things. OK, so that brings me to the second objective, which is to, is to design a research agenda for lifeline resilience in Australia. We really want to engage with you on this. It needs to engage many, many disciplines because so many aspects of this uh, uh, require the input from all sorts of different perspectives, conceptually, empirically, methodologically. To help inform this, we've got a case study in East Gippsland, which we're treating as a sandbox to trial different methodologies and try to identify those really key questions. So, the project runs till the end of the year. We're in the midst of the conceptual framework development at the moment, and a key part of that is a workshop we're running tomorrow. It's actually a special double billing, and I really encourage you to attend because this is something that we need to all put our brains to. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. I'd like to now invite up Dr. Nader Nader Paju from the University of Sydney to talk about the our community risk assessment project. Thanks, Nader. Thanks, Blair. Thank you, and I would like to reiterate the acknowledgement of the country. Uh, uh, in the in floods, uh, uh, pandemics, bushfires, community risk assessment is a baseline practice, whether we are facing a single uh, uh, hazard scenario or a multi-hazard scenario. And because of that, when I was going through the program, I was assuming that many would, would think this would be the most boring presentation. We have done community risk assessment forever. It has been studied extensively, and there is no buzzword in the title. So my name is Nader Nader Paju, and if you thought so, I'm here to convince you otherwise. And I'm representing a very multidisciplinary uh, team of researchers from the University of Sydney, which works very closely with New South Wales State Emergency Services and uh, obviously Natural Hazard Research Australia. 
So I would have two lines of reasoning, uh, parallel line of reasoning, the classic practice and, and theory. Practically, our field observation suggested that most of the agencies are at different stages of, of revising and significantly revising their community risk assessment practices and models. So some uh, have ju just finished the overhaul, major overhaul of their community risk assessment. Some were in the process of uh, revising their uh, community risk assessment, or uh, some were in the incubation period. They were thinking what would be the vision and where they want to uh, where they want to go. So this empirical observation suggested that the time is now. And this practice, this urgency that we can see in practice is also connected with the, with the theory where there is higher emphasis on uh, considering compound cascading multi-hazard scenario. And there are calls for uh, community risk assessment to address diversity of the communities, to reflect the dynamic nature of the community risk, and also to in incorporate uh, vulnerability and resilience uh, within the community risk assessment. So uh, those buzzwords are inherent concepts within, uh, within this research. So what we are, uh, uh, what we are performing is a, is a comprehensive systematic review of the literature and practice. I'm not going to bore you with detail. Our research fellow Ali is there, and he would be more than happy to discuss the detail with you. But what we are getting out of this uh, review are extensive set of uh, very big, large tables that provide alternative ways that community risk is defined, conceptualized, and, and assessed. And also goes into, into components of, for example, how uh, 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 hazard, exposure, and vulnerability are also de defined and assessed. And we use this systematic literature review to define a set of uh, tables, with the, also with our empirical study that we are having, to define a guideline that if any agency wants to develop or revise their community risk assessment, they can use this guideline. It would give you a set of principles of what should be done. Uh, it would also provide a range of alternative of what can be done. And also, if you want to do th things differently, if you want to get innovative, what is the spectrum of the possibilities? Because we believe there is no one way of doing community risk assessment. It depends on the context and what fits the context uh, better. While this would be the main uh, output of our project, I want to conclude my presentation with uh, uh, interesting observation that we had. And I would share it through a personal story. In 2019-2020 uh, uh, fires, I had an interview with uh, Canberra Times and uh, about the community that was affected by bushfires. And uh, after a few months, accidentally, I came in the social media. I crossed the link of the uh, link of the article, and I did what many of us would do. And sometimes we uh, uh, we are not saying that we are doing. And I went through the comments. Uh, up and down. There was lots of heated political debates. There was lots of efforts, and uh, and m m the interest, most interesting comments for, for for me still was very simple. Somebody was saying, "Doctor effing who," which, if you were wondering, they were referring to me. But what I observed, and this came to me a few weeks ago, what I observed in that comment section is exactly what we are observing in the in the context of community risk assessment. That there is a divide between that bottom-up, community-driven, locally-rich community risk assessment and agent, top-down, agency-driven uh, scientific and technical community risk assessment. So our future research aims to focus on, uh, on this divide. It's looked like a date, bad date, that two people are, are, are speaking different languages. Uh, so we would like to pay attention into this intersection between a bottom-up and top-down community risk assessment, what is the extent and, and, and content, con context of, of, of this tension in the intersection and how we can, we can address it. So we have a, a workshop tomorrow, which is more interactive, uh, and uh, Aaron, Ali, and Sarah would be there from the team. Kat maybe would be there as well. And we would be happy to discuss it there, and I would be happy also to discuss it uh, during the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. I would now like to invite up Dr. Matt Mason from the University of Queensland. Matt's going to tell us about a brand new project. 
uh, on modelling the impacts of sequential cascading natural hazards. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you, Blythe. Um, and I'm not sure if we take the cake for the newest project. I think we got told about it about three weeks ago. So, um, yes, not a lot has been done, suffice to say. Um, but the project uh, that we have is really looking at trying to create some of the tools that will allow some of the other sort of risk analysis that we've talked about. So really, uh, in sort of our terms, we're, we're trying to create vulnerability or fragility models for critical infrastructure assets. Uh, the project is a collaboration between several researchers at the University of Queensland, uh, the University of Technology Sydney, the Cyclone Testing Station at James Cook, and Risk Frontiers. Um, and given the, the new nature of it, this is my project so far. Um, but what, I see this as being something of a good thing because um, we now have the opportunity to get a lot of um, input from supposed end users. I, I never remember the term I'm meant to use and I'm sure it's not end users anymore, but um, we, we would really like to get input as to what are the tools that would be most required for doing some of this work. Um, and in particular, uh, things like uh, where, when we're looking at infrastructure, there is a lot of interactions between different infrastructure assets. So we lose power, you lose a lot of other things. So we're interested in that interaction between uh, different systems and what goes up and what comes down. So that's something that operators of the networks and the emergency services probably know a heck of a lot better than we do at this point. So we're, we're really in the first instance trying to learn as much as we can about what is already known before we sort of dive off and start doing our geeky engineering stuff and building models. Um, so that said, I'm going to now do what I tell all of my students not to do and put lots of words up on the screen. Um, but really, uh, to summarise, the, the purpose of the project, I can't read that, uh, is um, really we want to try and establish the, the context for how we do understand both direct and indirect losses and impacts on critical infrastructure networks. Uh, we also then need to develop the tools to be able to do it, and we're not doing this from scratch. It's not as though no one's ever thought of this before. There are multiple tools already available. The idea is we want to identify which ones are useful in the Australian context for our infrastructure network, and if they are, we can adopt them. If not, we may have to develop new ones. Um, and then we want to look at providing a framework that will allow us to try and assess uh, where sort of investment in resilience or strengthening of infrastructure networks is actually a good use of money. Okay, so uh, as w w with many of the other projects, people have talked talking about making things sort of people-centered. Here, we're actually probably unashamedly being financially centered. So a lot of investment is done and in these programs based on the dollar figures here. So so what we are really trying to understand here is how does this damage and impact flow on to the, the dollar losses. So the way we're going to sort of address this is in kind of three main approaches. The first one is a network mapping. So we've got some good people at the University of Queensland that are very good and have worked a lot, um, particularly with people in the mining industry, about mapping risk within their network. So we're going to look at um, a number of different infrastructure assets and hazards and mapping out some of these, uh, the, the risk within those networks. Uh, we then need to go on to actually build the, the damage functions and we're going to do this as I mentioned for both direct damage, so this could be uh, damage to a transmission tower like we had on that first slide there, but then also the indirect damage, so you lose that tower, what happens to the operability of the network and then what happens to the operability of other networks as well. Um, and then the third one is that we're going to sort of exemplify this through a series of case studies. And the first thing we're going to look at will be individual hazard and individual network case studies. So uh, could again be power infrastructure, a windstorm, power infrastructure, and what's the damage that happens. We then want to try and um, bring that together and look at, well, if we change something within that network, what will be the change in damage from a given event? 
Uh, then the last thing is really getting to the point of the cascading part of this project. Um, and we know that when we have either cascading or sort of multiplicative events, uh, the, the models we have aren't going to work. So you're starting from a very different damage, uh, very different state than an undamaged network. So we know our models aren't going to work. So we're going to mash them all together and basically see how wrong they are. And we have the objective of all, of all of that will be then to sort of say, well, we can't solve every problem in this project, but this is how we think you should go forward from here. Um, so if you're, this is interesting to you and you might be an end user or whatever the term is, and um, uh, that's in, interested in the project, please come along to our workshop tomorrow. Um, don't have too much more to say at the workshop, so it's going to be lots of time for answering questions and chatting. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Our next presentation comes from Dr. Jeff Keppert. Um, he's speaking to a project on fire studies at the Bureau of Meteorology. Thank you. Um, so this project is led by myself and Mika. Mika, unfortunately, cannot be here today, so uh, you get second best, never mind. Why case studies? Um, in the 10 years or so that I've been working with the CRC on fire, we've, done, we've performed a number of case studies and they've been significant learnings for us and I'm struggling to see the screen because I'm old and my glasses need refreshing, sorry. I'm gonna have to turn around and look up. Uh, they're a way of getting a handle on what actually happened in our lived experience. It gives us an opportunity to use more advanced techniques than are available in real time, to use techniques that are perhaps still under research and development. We have the time to gather all the relevant data. We have the benefit of hindsight. And bringing those things together, the per real purpose of a case study is to develop a deeper understanding of the what, how, and why actually happened. We did five of these case studies after the Black Summer fires, and you can actually pick up a brief summary report from the front desk if you want to know more about the sort of things we get from them. That knowledge translates into working practice, and it's used to improve the skills of practitioners and the practices. It leads to an information exchange between researchers and practitioners, both ways. We learn from each other, and the final reason it's important to do case studies is that even if we know everything today, we are managing fire in a changing climate. And the things that helped us, that worked for us uh, today, may not in the future. Someone earlier in the day used the word unprecedented with the Black Summer fires, which I think is very appropriate. The climate is changing. We need to change our practices, even if we're only going to stand still. So, as I said, we've done case studies for a while. What are we trying to do here to do them better? In a nutshell, the existing process has evolved over time. It's rather ad hoc. It requires very specialised staff, and it's not particularly streamlined. We propose, in doing two case studies during this project, to also streamline and automate our processes to lower the bar so that whereas in the past it's required a high degree of technical expertise to participate, we can get some operational staff who don't possess that expertise to come alongside and work with us and thereby raise their skill level and improve the knowledge transfer. We aim to deliver two particular studies. You can see the details up there and also a documented framework of how these things should be done in the future. We aim to streamline model run and visualisation, have input to training material and produce a discussion paper. This figure gives the broad context in which it sits. The case studies are examples of things we will do this time and have done in the past. Some of our capability, the tools we use are in TAN. Overarching is the people within the team and the strong link to operations that comes to us by virtue of being part of the Bureau of Meteorology and Operational Agency. So in summary, we aim to do case studies 
quicker, better, and faster, so that the learnings are available sooner, that the knowledge translates into action sooner. We aim to do them in a way that upskills our operational staff and improves the exchange of information between research and operations and across agencies. All of that, along with improving our scientific knowledge, we're also aiming to strengthen the existing good relationships we have between research and operations and with the agencies and across jurisdictions. And we also aim to do world-leading science. I'm not ashamed to say that it's the opportunity to do world-leading science that gets me out of bed in the morning. It's great to be able to do that world-leading science in a context that actually makes a difference to, pe to real people's lives. And so the relevance to end users that the NHRA brings and that the CRC, it's the two CRCs its predecessors have bought is a really valuable part of this. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much. I'm probably going to jinx us now, but um, we're actually doing really, really well for time. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to fall apart now that I've said that. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that um, I'm not sure, I've asked presenters to go into Slido and answer questions, but I'm not quite sure that that's working. So I'm going to ask Radia, who's I'm sure listening to me right now from our comms team, to check in how the presenters can do replies in Slido. And I'll either email you some instructions on that in a moment, but we will give, it, give the people putting questions in Slido, we will give the presenters a chance to get answers back to you. So thank you for being patient, Tom. This is Dr. Thomas Stuff from the CFA. He's introducing a new project that is not yet on our program. If there are any researchers out here who find this work interesting, you will see that there will be a call for expressions of interest to do this project coming out in the near future. Um, so this is a project on identifying and defining landscape dryness thresholds for fires. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm. For this one, because this project hasn't started, I'm happy to be called an end user for this one. And I might have to apologise in advance that I think I sent it through on the NHRA template. It looks like SharePoint might have done something a bit unusual. So hopefully I can speak to this one and it still makes sense for this project. Um, so what this project is, it's a, a fire-related project and it's looking at landscape moisture. So it's looking at when does the landscape dry out and that's really still uh, probably the single biggest challenge we have in fire management about knowing when the landscape becomes dry enough to burn and when it becomes dry enough to have big fires that we can't control. And we want to know this at scales in the short term, what's going to happen today, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen ne uh, in three months, what's going to happen in 20 years. So we really need to understand what we're dealing with in, in terms of landscape mo moisture. So there are indicators of fires out there that these indicate the potential for fires coming along. There's quite a lot of them. There's quite a lot of indices that come up everywhere. Um, and we really don't know which one to use. Like, if we're trying to make a decision, which of these indicators is going to be the best one to make a decision? Uh, there's a few more. I didn't add them all in. But basically, <coughs> what this project is about is, is the gap between what the science has done to understand landscape dryness and what we need to do to understand the decisions we're making. Um, so most of these links that we have, we can actually have an undeniable physical link to fire behaviour, but we actually don't have that link to what is the scale of information we need to make our decision. So as I said, there's a correlation with moisture, correlation with fire, but that detail on making the decision is not always there. Um, so what does this mean? We need to find what, what, which of these are fit for purpose, which of these can be used to make a decision and at what scale. We need to understand when we're using these inside their range and when we're using, using these outside the development ranges. An example of this, so this is one of these models that's at the heart of almost all our fire models in Australia, is the Keats Byram Drought Index. It's used it all over Australia, de developed in California for duff fuels. Duff means um, the, the, moisture, the needle at the bottom of a pine plantation, and it's used to calculate the models that fire, fuel availability for the fires that we have. So this is where it was developed, this is where it's used, and we really don't understand, well, it's not working as well as it should, and we really don't understand why, and we don't understand what the alternative should be. Um, often what we're using models for, there's all, also more than one purpose. So there's the MacArthur Forest Fire Danger Index, which is a very old index, and it's been used for suppressibility, forward rates of predicting forward rates of fire spread. 
Uh, looking at fire intensity, probability of any fires happening, looking at probability of uncontrollable fires, looking at severity or how bad a fire actually is when it does happen. And so does one index indicate all these values properly? That's what we need to find out. Um, and some of the important things we need to understand is that what is fit for purpose? That scientific evidence is not necessarily the same thing we need to, to make a decision. Um, for decision making, we need to understand the tolerance of error, the tolerance of getting it wrong, because that can vary. Um, this is Pascal's wager. So Pascal was about whether you should believe in uh, religion or not, and it's about there could be more consequences if you get it wrong in one direction than in the other. Um, also, overall model performance may not be that important. It might be more important to just get it right under those critical times. So you don't need to get it wrong right all the time, just at those critical times. You need to get it wrong generally when the, the fire is at their worst. Um, and generally, models need to be able to predict the future. We do have many moisture metrics, and some of them need information from now to predict what happened, and they can't really tell us what's going to happen. And so this is an example of what a, a moisture metric is used for to predict what the, the upcoming fire season is going to be like. And of course, with this with decisions, like the consequences of getting things wrong can be very high. Um, so for robust decision making, we need to know what the models are telling us. So what this project needs to do, it needs to look, review and look at landscape dryness metrics. It needs to determine the uses of the metrics that we have for decision making. It needs to, for each decision, it needs to look at the sensitivity and needs to look at what our knowledge needs are and look at how well he's been filled by existing metrics. And it needs to make recommendations on how, how pathways we can, what, what pathways we can have for improvement. And so this is a project that's seeking expressions of interest soon. So it will be done through the NHRA. The project isn't available yet, but I think it's coming in the, probably the coming months that this will be made available for expressions of interest. Thank you. All right, we're moving from a project not yet on the program to one of our well-established projects. So um, Dr. Chloe Begg, also from CFA, is going to talk about predictions in public, understanding the design, communication, and dissemination of predictive maps to the public. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks, Blythe, and hello, everyone. I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Also had some problems with the template, sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a very brief overview of a project that is a bit more established than the other ones we've heard today um, on behalf of the project team, who I will introduce in the following slides. So to begin, I'd like to give you a bit of a background on where, how this project came about. And it came about first and foremost because there's a lot of support at a Country Fire Authority in Victoria for research. We have an R&D team, you just heard Tom speak, he's part of the team that I work with, and we um, have 10 um, scientists who have a range of different backgrounds, and our um, remit in, within the team is to identify the challenges that um, agency staff face and also identify the uh, research contribution to addressing those challenges. And this um, particular issue became up um, as a challenge that agencies are currently um, uh, focusing on, and that's due to a number of factors, including the adva advancements in technology that have increased our opportunities um, to create and access intelligence. At the same time, we're seeing an, increasing, an increase in public expectations to be able to um, access real-time data. Also, um, over the past years, there's been um, recommendations from inquiries, reviews, and royal commissions, and we've heard it again today, that there's a need to improve um, our warning systems. Furthermore, the use um, of fire predictions was, um, has received a lot of um, publicity after the, during the, um, the, 19, uh, the 2019 and 2020 fires when red maps were released. Um, to the public in New South Wales and the ACT. And there's been lots of conversations about what the future of these products are across the nation. We also conducted um, research in Victoria where we asked operational um, staff to pr provide feedback on what they think the, the future of these products are. And while they um, did agree that it's important to provide the public with information, it, there was also some concern around um, when how to produce these products and when they should be released and how. So based on this, this research project offers an opportunity 
to reflect on the purpose of public-facing predictive fire spread maps and collect empirical data that can be used as evidence to support the future use of these products. And the aim of the project is to define how to future predictive products should be crafted to promote a safe and effective public response during a bushfire emergency. To achieve this aim, this project has been designed to be highly collaborative. We have used a co-design approach in the design of the research. Um, the team includes myself and Angela Gardner, oops, I've gone too far, um, who are coordinating the project, and we also have uh, research leads from a range of academic um, organisations. We also have a steering committee, um, and this committee is made up of members of the AFAC uh, Predictive Services Group as well as AFAC Warnings Group, and um, we have representatives from every jurisdiction. And this committee is responsible for providing feedback on the research, but also um, helping us to define the scope and define what sort of outputs um, should be developed as part of the research so that this research can be used directly um, after the research is complete and there's no need for that extra translation work afterwards. So the project has been broken down into three phases. Phase one is just about to be complete um, by the end of June. And we've been focusing or conducting empirical research that, um, interviews and surveys with agency staff and members of the community across the nation to better understand the status quo. So we want to understand um, what current map-based products um, are used during um, an emergency and how agencies and communities pr understand the purpose of those maps um, and um, how communities are currently using those products and how they intend to use them to make decisions during an emergency. So once we have that baseline, that foundational knowledge of how current products are being used and what the expectations are around them, we're in a really good space to move to phase two, which is about developing uh, map concepts using predictive um, products to uh, inform them. So we'll be de developing up together with our um, steering committee a range of map concepts that will be again tested with communities across the nation. And then once we've um, finished phase two, we'll be um, t turning our, our a focus towards um, developing um, practical outputs, and we've been funded for two of those. So I've got eight seconds. <laughs> so tomorrow, please come to the workshop. We'll be um, presenting on the, some more detail around the findings of phase one, and everybody's been talking about co-design um, in their projects, and we really want to discuss um, our experiences with that approach, but also hear from you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chloe. I would now like to invite Professor David Bowman from the University of Tasmania to talk about another new project on the program, Bushfire Risk at the Rural Urban Interface. Thanks, David. Yeah, how are you going? Uh, what I want to do is um, pan back and think about this problem. If you want to get into the details, then you should come to the workshop. And first of all, I'll tell you a story. I was listening to the radio and um, there was a distressed winemaker in uh, Canberra on the interface for the capital uh, because what had happened was a mob of kangaroos had learnt overnight how to eat grapes and they completely stripped the, the, uh, the vintage, was destroyed. It was very distressed. And I thought to myself, I think I know who that might be. And the next day, Brian Schmidt, the Vice Chancellor of the ANU, Nobel Prize winner, um, talked about the sad loss of his wine crop, his wine buff. And you know, Brian Schmidt is famous for understanding the origin of the universe. That's what he got a Nobel Prize for. And he said, yeah, managing kangaroos in an urban environment is a really tough problem. Okay, that's my point. This is a really tough problem. Nobody in the world has solved this problem, right? I want that to sink in, to think about what that means. That we are confronted with a problem that is hugely complicated, and one of the reasons it's hugely complicated is because it involves us. We're all contradictory, conflicted, put us in groups, we become political and tribal, we become uh, sometimes 
very um, accommodating and sometimes incredibly prickly. So we're trying to find a way where you can take uh, groups of people, you could call them a community, but there are many communities, you could call them a society, and to get them to adapt. So how do you do this? And I've been reading the literature and it turns out that what this group is doing, this cohort is doing, is you're actually inventing a discipline called adaptation research or adaptation science. There isn't actually a pathway. Now, what often you do if you, if you don't know that is you go, well, why don't we get in a social scientist? And it's a bit like, well, why don't we get in an artist? You know, what sort of artist do you want? A conceptual artist? Do you want, you know, somebody who's going to do landscape art, portraits, classical art? You know, what's an artist? What's a social scientist? And the point is that we're trying to actually solve a problem that is geophysical, biophysical, cultural, social, and it's adaptive because it's responding to rapid climate change. And so our project is actually trying to do all of those things. We've assembled a team, and one of the features of the team of being driven by adaptation research is that the, the problem of adaptation research is that there's a gun being held at your head. Hobart, where the, the, the location of the research, nearly burnt down in 1967, and it may be that in the period of this research gets hit again. So there's this incredible intensity of trying to solve a problem in real time in parallel, and you can't just say, well, we'll do it in sequence, we'll do this bit and this bit and this bit, then we'll get the answer. You actually have to do it all in parallel. And that makes for extraordinarily difficult project management because you're trying to do lots of things in real time and the stakeholders such as the city of Hobart and the other councils who have already unleashed uh, a program, a community program, and they're wanting us to inform their community program when we haven't even started the research. So at best we can document why their program failed. Or at best, we can inform their program in real time. So it's a little bit like trying to, uh, I don't even know what the analogy is, it's a bit like trying to build a shelter, you know, as uh, you know, a life-threatening blizzard is coming straight at you, that you're pretty well making things up as it goes along. So what, uh, we've got some natural advantages. Um, at Hobart is an extraordinarily brilliant test place to understand threats of bushfire, it nearly burnt down. We've got fantastic stakeholder linkages, we've got fantastic uh, political linkages, we've got really excellent linkages with the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. So what we're trying to do is to bring all of these elements together using basically inventing a new field of science called adaptation. It's an adaptation pathway. So come along, you will be completely mind blowing to see the complexity of this project, all of the things that we're trying to do in a staged way with a real tangible outcome of making an incredibly dangerous city safe before it gets burnt down. Thank you. Thank you, David. Dr. Raphael Blanche from the CSIRO is now going to tell us about another new project, Integrated Solutions for Bushfire Adaptive Homes. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Blythe, and um, yeah, great to be here today as well. And following on from David's presentation, our project is going to go deeper into the rural urban interface, into the adaptation and design as well. So we're going to look at uh, integrated solutions for bushfire adapted home. This is a project that is done in collaboration with uh, RMIT, with Melbourne University, CSRO, with Country Fire Authority, and also with New South Wales Rural Fire Services. As Blaise mentioned, this is a new project. So today I'm gonna to give you a bit of an overview um, you know, on what are the scopes, some of the challenging, challenges sorry, we're facing, what we like to do, but I really encourage you to come uh, tomorrow to the workshop as well so we can you know, continue the conversations and engage with uh, people that are interested because that's the way we like to do this, this project as well with a lot of engagement. Um, first, 
what do we mean by bushfire adaptive home? And this is the definitions at the beginning of the project, and I'm sure at the end of the project there will be a lot of change. We're looking at fixed dwellings that have a high probability of surviving a bushfire. And by its design, will not present a life risk to the occupants, but also to the neighboring houses. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of challenges to achieve this goal. And for example, if you know, I put myself in the in 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 shoes of um, a practitioner, like an architect or um, a builder, or if, you know, as a resident, if I have to choose a fire-resisting materials, which means picking, for example, between masonry, metal, or wood-based product, how do I make this choice? How do I um, consider this within the, uh, you know, being compliant to building and planning regulation, which could be considered like a, a good solution, versus exceeding compliance, which could be considered as a better solution, versus having the most effective option, which could be considered as, you know, the best solutions within your case and within your context as well. And really, how those, um, those choices would influence the uh, overall sustainability of the design, considering, you know, the, um, the embodied energy, the efficiencies during the life cycle, during lifespan of the building, and also the recyclability at the end of the building. Could we consider, for example, some co-design and some co-benefit option that works for some aspect of the building, but work also for, for bushfire? <laughs> Ooh, sorry about that. Another question we have with, uh, with this project is, how would he, do we navigate the different guidance and advice from commercial and regulatory sources, and that use, for example, the term compliant, tested, certified, fire resisting, fire resistant. So there is a lot of information out there from the regulatory framework, from the commercial product, from educations as well, from guidelines, best practice, and good information, but also misinformation. So how can we um, engage with, um, with the residents to give them you know, and help them to discern good and bad information. And how can we empower the residents to understand how to adapt and how to develop and build bushfire adaptive house? So for these projects, we're looking at also a different type of approach, which is, seems to be a very common approach uh, within this group, um, where we're not going to produce, produce sorry, a guideline or a magic project. We want to engage with residents and um, relevant stakeholder as the driver of the change. So that means exploring the type of behavior and motivation that residents will face and when they have to build a new house, we have to renovate or they have to maintain a house. So we're looking at this journey of this resident within this complex system that they have to face when they want to uh, um, make a house more adapted to bushfire. We also like to identify the current practice that inform and support the community decision making. And particularly, we are interested in um, the resident experience and the, uh, you know, the awareness of engagement around breast practice. And within this engagement, looking at the interactions with the relevant stakeholder so we can achieve a more effective and a more resilient um, overall outcome. And that could look like, you know, encouraging residents to include a more uh, bushfire adaptive type of uh, measures. So we use a mixed method for this, for this project, case studies, and also we're going to use some uh, co-design and co-productions approach. And that's the idea to bring together residents and stakeholders um, in developing new processes so they can share credible information about home adaptation options. And we hope that with also this co-design approach, we, um, that would you know, reveal some new opportunity for incentive and change of behavior. And that could be useful for different type of stakeholder, but also could be useful for different type of residents within uh, you know, across a very different uh, range of um, uh, bushfire prone area. We also hope that with this approach, we uh, can identify some opportunity uh, for intervention that can be tested in the future 
by different type of agency, fire services, or planning information. So if you want to know more about this project, please come along um, tomorrow, 12.15. We would have people from, you know, we have Laura from CSRO, Mitul, Delaney from um, RMIT, Mark, Chloe, and John from Country Fire Authority. So come along so we can continue the, the conversation. And I have a hard think about how can I convince people to come along. I would bring cheese and baguettes, so please come along. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Um, we're actually ahead of time, so we're going to, I'll just let presenters know, we'll be answering some questions at the end of the next presentation that I will be giving. So I think the best way to do that might be, and I'm looking at David over on the side there, to get a mic so that presenters can just stand up and answer questions from the floor. So I won't ask you to come back up on the stage, but we'll, we'll do that in a moment. So I am going to talk about the last project on here before we um, take some questions. This is a project that is forthcoming. It's not yet on the program. We don't yet have a research team in place for it. The project's called Natural Hazards and Resilience in Complex Urban Systems. We have put out an expression of interest and a message to the researchers in the room who may or may have not um, put in submissions to that AOI process. We will not keep you waiting very much longer for an outcome of that process. We will be announcing a team that's taking on this project very soon. But it's an important project that feels quite uh, a niche in the program, so we wanted to make you aware that this is, is coming up. So, a bit of the background to why this project is, um, where this project came from, is despite attention to urban resilience, of which there's been much in recent years, um, the complex, the multi-scale, the non-linear and the variable ways that urban systems interact with natural hazards and with other stresses and shocks has left a gap between the aspirational goals of urban resilience and the discourse around urban resilience on one hand and the capacity that exists to enhance and enact urban resist resilience um, initiatives on the other hand. So this project is really about bridging that gap and building capacity to enhance resilience in urban systems in practice. It was developed from a stakeholder workshop and numerous follow-up consultations to identify key areas where research can really have an impact in this area. So from all of that consultation, the project is centered on three main objectives. So the first is to increase understanding within the emergency management sector about multi-dimensional compounding and cascading disaster impacts arising from natural hazards for communities that are located in major urban areas in Australia and the ways that those impacts might change over time under the influence of climate change, rapid urbanisation and other factors that influence urban systems. And a, a focus in there is really on that multi-dimensional aspect. So we're looking beyond the most kind of obvious visible impacts of natural hazards in urban systems onto those fl flow on impacts through social, environmental, economic systems, psychological impacts, et cetera. So a, a very holistic multi-dimensional understanding. That's what the sector has told us that it would like to understand better. The second objective is developing guidance for a range of organisations, but I think primarily for local and local government and community organisations, but also for state government and emergency services, to conceptually map vulnerabilities and resilience within urban systems at local and regional scales, and to demonstrate the application of that guidance with a proof of concept case study. So this may not be about developing something new. There are um, approaches to doing that out there already. It may be guidance for selecting and applying existing approaches well and in the right context. The third objective for this project is a complex one, but a really important one. So this is about developing process principles and standards for use by those organisations, again, local, state government, emergency services and community organisations to effectively prioritise and influence urban resilience investment at local, state and federal levels, and also to um, start developing frameworks to monitor and evaluate the outcomes of urban resilience investment. And this is really recognising that decision making about urban resilience investment is coordinated largely at state and federal levels, 
And so this project aims to develop process guidance that supports local and regional priorities and experiences and knowledge to inform and influence that high level decision making. Now this project intersects with quite a few of the other projects that you're hearing about at the forum. Um, so we'll be fostering and supporting linkages between this project and others. And something's really nice about this project as well, it will be closely, um, the project team will be working closely with Ada um, so that the project informs a new urban resilience handbook that's in planning for addition to the disaster resilience handbook collection. So the ultimate aim of this project is to lead to more efficient and informed decision making for risk reduction and urban resilience through, for example, urban planning, building standards, local program design and delivery, and as well as increased capability to monitor and evaluate outcomes of those investment decisions. So stay tuned for more information about that project as it comes onto our program. So we have time for questions to presenters. So I'm going to go back into Slido, and I'm sure we're going to get a bunch of questions come through now that you know we can answer them live. Uh, I'm going to start with, oh, thank you, David. One for Lauren. So um, how might this concept of lifeline resilience also be relevant to urban communities, particularly around heat, given larger population sizes in urban centres and well-documented breaking down of social connections in urban communities. And there's a mic coming your way. <laughs> Great, thank you to whoever put that in there. And um, it's a, actually, it's a fantastic opportunity to explain that we're really taking a very geographically um, oriented approach here that tries to understand the ways in which lifelines, so by which we're talking critical infrastructure, essential services, supply chains, actually help to shape and define uh, what counts as urban, rural, remote, etc. And then you start to see that the ways in which uh, lifelines interact in those areas uh, leads itself to a focus on certain things. So you think about urban areas, you think about the concept of urban resilience, when we hear that term we tend to realise that it, it tends to be focused on the socio-technical. So urban resilience is about the urban functioning, successfully functioning. We know that at the heart of all of those different sorts of services etc, electricity is pretty key there. What's electricity especially sensitive to? It's heat. And so you start to see that there's positive feedbacks between the sorts of contexts that focus our attention on certain sorts of issues, etc. Now, this um, question also really helpfully um, allows me to point out that we are critiquing the gaps as well as the sort of biases, and I mean that in the sort of gentle way that we're all inherently biased, biases in these kind of areas like critical infrastructure. So we're looking at the ways in which currently, from say, for example, an Australian government perspective, uh, there's not a lot of discussion of social infrastructure. There's not a lot of discussion of natural infrastructure. Yet, without air, water, country, social connections, um, you know, all of these other big built assets aren't much good. So we're definitely uh, looking at that and teasing out things like, is there an inverse relationship between the density of built infrastructure, aka a city, uh, and the uh, reliance on the health, the activeness of social infrastructure? Arguably, this question suggests that perhaps there is. And so you start to sort of see that these questions are really interconnected. So what we're trying to do is say, it's not, as I said, it's not like disasters happen to lifelines, disasters happen through lifelines. So, sorry, it sounds awfully academic, but <laughs> I'm an academic. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. The next question is for Nada. So, it's just right there, Lana. So, um, have the multitude of already existing tools and methods been assessed? including in the climate change realm, and what would this research add to the existing body of work? Thank you, and I was just looking and there was another question which is in the 
very similar, uh, 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 pointing to the similar issue, which is about the NIRAG especially. So I think, uh, I think this question is uh, already considered within the, within the call for proposal that we even replied and, and, and applied for it, uh, which is when, when we look at the synthesis of the research and practice, there is an acknowledgement that there is a lot there. And we want to make sense of what, what are the options, what are the alternatives, and how each of them would work uh, within the different contexts that, uh, that we are having. So what we are aiming to produce and the belief that we have at least so far in the project is that there is no one solution. There are multiple ways. Depending on the context, you can choose the, uh, each of these tools. And I'll give you one example. For example, a lot of the uh, uh, resilience indices that are available out there both in Australia and internationally, they are looking at the community as one homogeneous uh, uh, and not non-diverse community. While uh, we had in, in some of the interviews, for example, in, in one region, uh, they were talking specifically that they have a very, very diverse set of a community, that they have very different, uh, different need when, when the disaster is happening. So the community risk assessment needs to make sure that if they are using the resilience index for preparing the resources, they need to address the, both, both ends of this, uh, the, the spectrum. So what we are aiming to produce is that, first of all, we have this list of tables as a synthesis, how each of them can be used. And also, if we are using one of them, what are the nuances that we, we need to consider and we add uh, uh, to, our, to our planning? Thank you. There's a couple of questions here for Dan and team before I flow to the question up there for Tom, so you can have a read of it and think ahead, Tom. Um, so these are, I guess, comments, but would be good for you to comment on the comment <laughs> um, and the degree to which you think the project will be addressing these types of issues. So, um, so one is around the question of having asked permission from participants for data to be accessible and shared for others. And the other is around the ethics of easily identified participants, even if their names and personal information aren't shared, um, being accessible for future projects and being kept. Um, I guess a comment on the, it's how, I guess how your th what your thinking is around how you're gonna tackle those types of issues in the project. Thank you, Blythe, and thank you for whoever asked these questions. Uh, they're very valuable questions and they're the issues that we'll need to be working through as we work with you around how you would like your data stored. Um, it's also about working with the um, human research ethics committees at uh, multiple universities across Australia to also identify what needs to be included in the application forms, in the consent forms that go out to the um, people that we're working with when uh, we go and do interviews or focus groups and things like that. So it's clearly stated about, uh, and it's very clear to them how their data is going to be used and that they have, they give full permission um, whether it is to be used or not to be used, or whether it's to be de-identified, whether they would like to be contacted before it is used by other researchers. Um, so a whole range of different things that we'll need to explore with you and with community leaders around how this can actually be achieved. So it is creating a set of guidelines. Um, it will also be dependent upon uh, your own research ethics committees, uh, and you would be working with them uh, to ensure that if somebody else comes in and would like to access your data, they don't just get it freely. They also have to abide by your um, your own application process and what the agreements have been with your universities or the institutions that you work with. So there's a lot of work to do, um, but and that's why it's really good to have that conversation tomorrow at 12.15 with you. Or if you can't attend tomorrow because we've got a lot of competition petition particularly with cheese and baguettes being offered. Um, we come and see us and we can take your names down and uh, include you in part of the research process throughout the year. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So Tom, this might be looking ahead. Where did Tom go? There's Tom. Um, might be looking ahead into the project a little bit. There's a question here around the types of data you're using or suggest using for identifying drought. Yeah, it's a good question because it probably means I didn't explain the project well enough. So we have quite a lot of drought indices that are used for other purposes. So they're used to explain like fire ignitions or fire behaviour. 
And what we want to understand is like, well, what indices, how, how, how are these indices appropriate for measuring the things we want to know, so fire behaviour or f number of ignitions. So the data we need to look at will be actually the, the, the activity related to the decisions we make. So this could include information that we use in fire simulators for predicting fire today. It could be information we use for looking at making fire danger ratings. It could be information we use in looking at bushfire outlooks and also looking at long-term in climate change. But invariably, one of the things we're going to have to really focus on is fire activity and whether the indices are sensitive to pick up the change we want to make a decision on and also whether they're specific enough so that they're not just doing false alarms all the time, they actually pick up the right information at the right time. And one of the key things that these indices have been developed to, to indicate drought, they haven't actually developed for, been developed for fire in most cases. And so we're kind of using it outside their bounds and we, we want to know, understand what, our, what the weaknesses are. So it's about taking what we have in the weather indices and then linking it to real fire activity that links to the, the decisions we make. Thank you. I think the next question there that I might take was one for me for the um, natural hazards and urban resilience, well, for the research team who's going to take on that project. Um, but I'll take that one, this query to that team um, when we have a team on board. So this is around how Australia's pandemic plan considers everyone, live, considers that everyone lives in a single dwelling and we know that that didn't help the one in four people who live in strata. So can you include strata in your impacts within that project? The short answer to that is yes. So within the, um, the brief on that project, it actually specifies that we want to look at higher density, a, high, a, a case study at least in a higher density and a lower density urban area within a major urban centre so that we're looking at the different, um, the different issues in those, those different settings. So in the higher density areas, of course, the strata and multi-level living um, being a factor there. Um, but if you wanted to follow up on that, any questions or comments for that project, you're welcome to email to me to follow up on with the team as that project gets going as well. And I think we have time for one more question before we go across to our PhD presentations. Chloe, <laughs> have you read the question? Yep, read the question. So the background on the collaborators in your project. So presume you have social researchers involved and will you be working with end users? Yes, so I guess with same as Tom, I didn't present that very well. But we do have most of the, well, all of the researchers on the project are social scientists. So we have Tim Neal, anthropologist, Erica Kulogalski, evacuation modelling expert. We have Amy Griffin, who is a cardiographer. And um, we have Paula Dutson, who is a risk communication specialist. We are also working together with um, AFAC, um, representatives of AFAC group. So we have AFAC Predictive Services and the AFAC Warnings Group, and they are mostly made up of... And we also have um, Fiona Dunstan from um, the Bureau of Meteorology as well. And most of the people who are the representatives of those AFAC groups work within emergency management, or well, they all work within emergency management organisations, and we meet every two weeks. So we have a standing um, invite in our calendars, and so we're keeping that conversation going. And it's been really great. And if any of um, those end users or collaborators are here today, thank you, thank you, thank you, because it's been such a good ex um, experience for us as researchers to better understand your context. And I hope it's been also um, very informative and helpful for you to understand how the research is working. Thanks, Chloe. So that was the last question from, the, from Slido. Thank you. I'm so pleased we had a chance to get some um, responses live from our presenters. I'm very pleased now to pass on to the final section of this session of the forum, which is presentations from some of our PhD students. So I'll invite you up one at a time, so it won't make you sit up on the stage um, altogether. So our first um, presentation is from Tony Jarrett, um, speaking to his project on agency experts supporting bushfire resilience education in primary schools. Thanks. Well, it's wonderful, wonderful to be here. Um, I wanted to start my little talk by recognising uh, my original principal supervisor at Central Queensland University, a friend of many here, I, I expect, and that's the late um, Professor Kevin Ronan. It's very influ influential on, on my work and my, my progress. Um, it seems like there's a lot of, uh, or too many exploding heads in the education sector at the moment 
lot of issues with um, curriculum. Too, uh, curriculum's too crowded. There's reviews going across the, uh, across the nation in various forms. Um, teachers and parents, you know, or teachers pressing parents to, to be teaching this or that, and you know, people are leaving the prof profession seemingly in droves. And at the same time, we as agencies are, are wanting to, to push more programs and activities into those school spaces. So this can be um, quite challenging, and I think the education sector is probably at the point where they're not going to accept that anymore or, or not readily accept that. And, and particularly these sort of program expansions. So, but there is hope, and I think that hope actually rests in working with what teachers and educators are actually doing already in classrooms through their curriculum activity and, and, the, and the way they might be going about their teaching business. And it's vitally important, I believe, that we're actually including young people in our, in our activities, um, hearing their voice and empowering them to actually adapt and mitigate natural hazard um, risks such as bushfire, and to uh, you know, avoid another exploding head, I suppose, we, we need to be able to um, identify and utilise those connections that we can uh, actually see and, and work with in that school context, particularly in that, that curriculum and classroom practice area. My research actually is looking at one of those such connections. In New South Wales, in the, in the geography um, syllabus, there's a unit of work in, in stage three, which is years five and six, which actually looks at the, at the study of bushfire. How bushfires, a contemporary bushfire event, affects, um, has an impact on people, places, and the environment. So in, in, in that context, a lot of RFS volunteers, like myself, are actually involved in working with schools and supporting that, those, those activities around that stage three unit. But there isn't actually a lot of evidence around how that work is actually um, you know, progressing. I'm using case study and looking at, a, uh, at, um, at the impact that those volunteer firefighters have in those classroom settings and uh, about how students understand natural hazards, risks, and bushfire. I've collected, um, my, my data has been collected from 34 semi-structured interviews with teachers, RFS volunteers, parents, and, and, um, and also 17 group interviews with um, young students, um, which has been quite an, an illuminating process. And, and I think there's a, a bit of gold that I'll actually be, be finding as I go through that um, data analysis. The, one of the research outputs will identify effective me methods for volunteer firefighters to employ in classrooms um, to best support student learning. And I'll deliver a, uh, a profile of sorts, I suppose, that might categorise um, or um, the characteristics anyway of, of volunteers likely to be most effective in, in working with schools and students. And my work will also be of benefit to other agencies that have any volunteers who are working in the school space um, across any of the, the hazard areas. And lastly, also for the education sector, I see that I'll be able to identify um, the value of these collaborations that we can have um, that, that have expert partners actually supporting the, the student learning process. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Our next presentation will be from Phoebe Quinn, and Phoebe's PhD project is on a new democratic process for climate and disaster resilience. Thanks, Phoebe. Thanks, Blythe. Um, sorry, I just kept my notes up. Um, oh, sorry, bear with me one second. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone, I'm Phoebe Quinn. I'm from the University of Melbourne. I'm a research fellow and PhD candidate and I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Wurundjeri country today. Um, so as you're all very well aware, uh, disasters and climate change are forcing communities to face really tough decisions about what to do. Um, and um, that's throwing up lots of disagreement and it can be hard to identify points of consensus and make progress uh, through all of that. Um, and 
often in terms of those decision making processes, there's a trade off between, um, on the one hand, the number of people that you can involve in the decision making processes, and on the other hand, the nuance and the richness of discussions. So those challenges in democratic processes, I suppose, um, apply not just to issues of you know, relating to climate change and disasters, but all sorts of issues um, across society. So the good news is that across the world, um, there are a lot of innovative approaches and tools that are being developed um, and being used to address some of those um, challenges. Um, and that includes things like um, uh, deliberative democracy approaches, like I'm sure many of you will be familiar with things like citizens' juries, um, but also um, new uh, digital technologies that leading governments around the world are beginning to use, um, particularly in Taiwan, but all, all around the world, um, such as Polis. If How do I go to the next slide? Oh. Yeah. So Polis is um, the platform, this online platform that I'm focusing on in my research. And it's a cutting edge tool that has been really thoughtfully designed to um, support large groups of people to participate in online discussions about contentious issues and really to try to um, enable richer discussions about these issues than would be possible through simple voting processes or surveys. Um, but also avoiding some of the challenges that come up with um, social media discussions. Um, for example, things going off on tangents and sort of um, getting personal. Um, so how Polis works is essentially that you set a topic for the discussion. Like, so you can see here this screenshot from an example conversation. Um, and people go on there and they see one by one comments that other people have put in on that topic. And they can either agree, disagree, or pass. And then it pops up with the next comment and the next comment. And they can keep going for as long as they like. Um, and they can also put in their own comment in their own words if they don't feel like their views are already represented in the existing comments. And in real time, uh, Polis analyzes the patterns of agreement and disagreement and displays um, the sort of patterns in that landscape. Um, so it identifies opinion groups and you can see what the sort of defining uh, views are in each of those groups. And it also in real time creates a, a really detailed report that uh, updates as the conversation evolves and enables you to identify um, in particular the comments that uh, where there's sort of consensus across those different opinion groups. Um, so with my PhD, what I'm doing is action research to um, explore the role that the use of polis could play in community decision making and resilience um, in climate, so around uh, contentious issues around climate change and disasters. So I've done one case study, or I've mostly done one case study so far, and I'm currently um, setting up partnerships for my next case study, so in conversations mostly with local governments who are keen to use this um, to help work through issues that are uh, locally relevant. Um, so um, on the next slide, there's a QR code with um, if you want to find out more. Um, but yeah, also please come say hi or um, shoot me an email if you're interested in this project particularly, um, but also just in the sort of democratic innovation and civic technology stuff uh, more generally. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our lucky last speaker today in this session is Heba Motadi Ali, who's talking about her PhD project towards disaster resilient hospitals, investigating perspectives and opportunities for empowering healthcare workers and leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Heba from Griffith University and I'm excited to talk about my PhD journey, which is almost at the final stage. Actually, this PhD journey is my second PhD. My first one, it was medical doctorate. I know maybe you are thinking and asking yourself, why am I doing a second PhD? This is because after many years of working as medical academic from multidisciplinary perspectives, I believe that I can help hospitals to be resilient from 
multidisciplinary perspectives, like from public health, quality management, disaster management, and health profession education perspectives. First of all, I would like to pay my respect to elderly past and emerging. And talking about the disasters, it's widely accepted that disasters and climate change impacts are increasing in frequency and severity. And people expect that during disasters, hospitals should be accessible and fully functional. What if not? What if hospitals can't be resilient and accessible during disasters? That's why the overarching question for my PhD project is that how can hospitals be resilient to ensure their business continuity during disasters? For the sake of time, I will talk about the research findings as the publications and the relevant uh, contribution to knowledge for each publication. So, so far I have like the outcome of this research is four publications. For each one, there are, um, I, will, I will mention only the significant contribution to knowledge. Like for the first one, it was systematic literature review. And this systematic literature review developed an innovative de decision support model for decision makers. The second one was also systematic literature review, and it led to proposed nine areas for hospital organizational learning and also for the hybrid resilience learning framework. The other two, they were empirical based on interviewing staff so one of them developed the healthcare worker resilience toolkit and the other one and the education component for this resilient toolkit included the pre-disaster disaster and post-disaster stages and the other one the other empirical research it developed the transformational leadership a model for hospital disaster resilience and checklists for self-assessment of leaders so in summary, these findings culminate to support leaders, support staff, and enhance safety and increase resilience of hospitals to be resilient. And thank you so much. I want to give a huge shout out to all the presenters in this session because you've been absolutely amazing. It is really not easy to talk about complex research issues in five and even three minutes and everyone has done such an amazing job of it. Um, so kudos to everybody. Yes, thank you. There are some questions in Slido and I think I'm not driving Slido properly because um, presenters can jump in, hit replies under questions and provide answers. Thanks, Matt. I think you've already been in there. Um, so if you have put questions to presenters, um, Slido won't tell you when it's been answered, so check back a little bit later. The presenters will be going through and, and having a look at the questions for them and giving answers in Slido for you. So that brings us to the end of this session. We are now breaking for a one hour lunch break um, outside. Uh, we'll be back in here at 1.30 where we'll go have our final session of five minute presentations followed by our third First Nations presentation on cultural land management. So thank you very much for your attention and enjoy your lunch.